as long as it's forward. God, send me anywhere, only go with me. Lay any burden on me, only sustain me. And sever any tie in my heart, except that tie that binds my heart to yours. If you have men who will only come if they know there is a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come if there is no road at all. I will go anywhere, provided it be forward. David Livingstone, as long as it's forward. Thank you ever so much, and welcome everyone to Gems from the Wisdom Traditions. Uh, this is the year uh, where our theme is forward, eyes to the stars. And it really is a very active pointing uh, theme. And that is appropriate um, today for our theme of the week, which is Karma Yoga, the Path of Action. We are so fortunate to have Dr. Vina Howard um, from Fresno State University um, joining us today. Um, Vina could speak from a number of different religious and philosophical traditions. And today, um, we're especially fortunate to have her speak from the Jain tradition. Um, this is not a tradition that we often get to hear anyone speak upon, and it is one of the important world um, traditions. And um, so this topic, which could be viewed also from the Hindu tradition, I think it will be very interesting for us to get a different look at it. She's going to look at a particular um, exponent of this this idea of karma yoga who uh, served as an exemplar and a mentor to Mahatma Gandhi. So Vina, if we could let you take it away. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Good to see everyone. My goodness, all over the world, people. Good to see you, Vina. Yes, thank you. So I would really would like to have this time really circle the way um, Renee has intended to be. So let's have a lot of conversation. But I first want to ask, how many of you know much about Jainism? Poquito, a little bit? Okay, that's good. Um, so just to give it maybe um, the first part, I'm just going to talk about the main tenets of Jainism. Second part, I'm going to talk about um, this individual, um, Srimad Rachandra, who was contemporary of Gandhi and who was very influential uh, to Gandhi. And the third, I'm going to do how Gandhi takes a lesson from him and makes his own for his path of action. And of course, in between, all of us can raise hand or not raise hand, start talking. Okay. So interruption is completely permiss permissible. So no interruption, just start, you know, just have a circle. So um, some people think when we look at Wikipedia or any other sources that Jainism started 2,500 years ago with uh, Lord Mahavira, who was contemporary of the Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha. But that's incorrect. Jainism started this say, no one knows its historical beginnings. And uh, Mahavira is the 23rd, sorry, 24th of Jina or Tirthankara in the line of those teachers. And those are all called Jinas, the ones who have conquered their self. So it's very interesting um, that they call it conquerors, the conquerors of their minds, their, their senses. There's a whole tradition that continues um, till 20, you know, fifth, uh, 2500 BCE, when the Buddha was born, Lord Mahavira, that's considered to be the last one. But that's interesting that I, I attended Sri Madhrachandra conference last weekend in Phoenix. I was invited to attend um, his big uh, convention that happened and I went to, as a scholar and as a guest uh, to, because I'm writing on Srimad Rachandra as a karma yogi and there, and what Gandhi is saying about Srimad Rachandra. So I wanted to speak with the teacher of the tradition, Acharya, and see what does he think about. So it's, everything is very 
fresh in my mind um, as I'm looking at this new books that I got and all kind of goodies from that big convention. So Jainism, if you want to know one thing that is really propagates, believes, teaches, practices, ahimsa or nonviolence. So we, when we think about nonviolence, what do we think? Anybody, just quickly, what do we think? What comes to our mind, nonviolence? Yes. Don't hurt things. Don't hurt, but who do we not hurt? Human beings? Everything. Everything. And when we say everything, what does it mean? What do we think when we think everything? Living things. And what are the living things? All Just natural things. Every name one living thing that you like that you don't want to get hurt. A think pig. A pig, okay. <laughs> How about microorganisms also, that we don't hurt microorganisms? When I'm breathing right now, I'm hurting micro microorganisms. So what many Jains used to do, they wear masks. So I tell my students, so why did, we, why did we wear mask during the COVID? Why do we wear mask? Why do we mask ourselves? So we didn't infect anyone else, right? And we were also protected. We are protected because we don't want to get this microorganisms, booty things in our breath or in our nose and our body not be invaded by. So we want to save ourselves, protect ourselves. And Jane teachers have been wearing masks that they don't hurt the microorganisms. Do you see the difference? Yes. But in doing so, they are saving themselves and they are saying, saving the microorganism as well. However much scientifically happens, we know some that when we wear mask, a mask that is more likely that we won't get infected when we are close to somebody who is sick. So the whole idea was that the Jains imagined a universe where everything was alive. Everything was alive, the trees, the water, air, plants, everything. So if I see everything what I see has a soul and is alive, how am I going to live? How am I going to, how am I going to breathe? How am I going to live? I'm going to walk, I'm going to eat. How am I going to live? Well, don't they think you should like only eat fruit that's already fallen on the ground? That's the one of the ideas that because we need to live, right? We have yeah. human birth and we want to live. So Carolyn, you're absolutely right. So doing things that we cause absolute less violence. Mm -hmm. Because We're not, Gandhi says, living means killing. When we walk in this earth, on this earth, we are killing. Yes, no, maybe. Mm -hmm. I used to think, oh, I'm vegetarian, I'm nonviolent. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Living in this house, our culture, our world, driving. You know, I kill so many bugs when I go up the mountains. And, you know, we kill all the time. And digestion, that's the other thing, that you're digesting food. That's also killing. So I how heard that. Sorry? I've heard that the genas live on air and don't wear any clothing. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> but then, I mean, that's... that's a good point. But how do we bring this to the householder now? Hmm. The householders are not being naked, right? The householders are like us. They were super wealthy. They were the convention was in Sheraton, and you know, hmm. wonderful food, and so. How do we how do we live in this world, right? That's the whole idea. So the Jainism had nonviolence is the, the number one, the most prominent virtue or vow. Then is asteya, means in non-stealing. Non we steal from others when we're using too much of anything, according to Jainism. So again, they gave up clothes. The, the teachers don't even wear clothes, wear clothes, a lot of them or at least the, the Gambara Jains, not the Shatambra Jains, and Satya, speaking truth, living truth. A lot of time we think we are speaking truth, but we are, it, it, truth has a larger meaning. 
not simply not lying, but living with full integrity. That live with the true, true, uh, we call it nowadays authentic self, bring your authentic self. But if our world brought our authentic selves, we will be in much better shape in this world. But we are not bringing our authentic selves. And the fourth was brahmacharya, which was um, literally means celibacy or living in the divine, but really abstaining from indulgences in sensual things. So for monks and nuns was vow of celibacy. For um, house, uh, householders was not committing adultery or being true to your spouse, you know, that very pure relationship. And then the last is aparigraha. Aparigraha is non-hoarding. That again, I give a whole talk on aparigraha, because uh, when we when we look at our world, you know, we have so much more than we need, right? So again, the Jain monks and nuns live very very simply, and non-hoarding, because according to Jainism, even hoarding is a form of violence. So all four other vows are all connected to non-violence. One more thing I want to give you and might sound like a mouthful, so I'm going to write in chat, and it's called Anekantavada, which means um, many-sidedness of the truth. Or reality. So according to them, the reality that we, we perceive each one of us are seeing this world, any situation, differently. If we go in the same room, we will have a different view because we already are filtering through our own thoughts. When we talk to someone, they say that first 30 seconds, we judge a person and rest of it fill in later because we already have those preconceived notions. So James think that we have to be very, very mindful of that we have limited view of the reality. We have limited view of the reality. So if I, that's why all James also believe we should respect all, all religions because each religion is looking at the reality from their own point of view. That's why I think in our world, political world too, if we can talk, dialogue, understand with one another, looking at that this may have some kind of truth, then we are being less violent to the world and to that point of view. So we can not only be violent to things, living beings, but we can be violent toward people's thoughts and feelings and point of views and perspectives. So how we live in this world, that is the main point of um, going through this world. Now, how do you do karma yoga in this world when you are, Jainism is very renunciatory tradition. Although it is kind of very kind of um, paradox, on the one hand, the Jain monks and nuns, the they tradition is going on for 2,500 years and they completely renounce. I mean, completely renounce. But then you have a, over 90% is a Jain lay men and women community who are the one of the wealthiest community in India, right? So they have, you know, they're the one who are endowing my chair, uh, Jains and Hindus together. And they are giving millions and millions of people to study Jainism all over the United States and world. So how do we bridge that gap between, you know, householder work, and then you go to um, renunciation. So here plays the karma yoga. So when I was studying Jainism, I didn't see that term too much around. There was a lot more, the karma is bad, and the karma is binding, not bad, the binding in Jainism. All karmas are binding. When it's karmas, it's not like in Hinduism or Buddhism, karma is a sticky substance. When we do any action, it becomes like a film on our soul. And karma has different kind of colors. And then colors taint our soul, and we have to wash it off through renunciation, 
through meditation, through prayers, and not doing too many actions. The meritorious actions create good karma and the not so good actions create bad karma. Nevertheless, they both are a film around us. So that film, film has to be removed in order to attain this liberation or the divine. That's the Jainism in 12 minutes. Um, <laughs> so this is the picture of you know the generally the householder and the renunciate householder's goal is to also renounce eventually and not in this life the next life and the next life and people know this and they begin to to go they serve the monastic people they do rituals they've created temples op opulent temples to make good karmas and have a good life so then eventually they'll transcend the cycle of death and rebirth. But Srimad Rachandra comes into picture. He is um, born in eight, 1867 and dies in 1901. He's 33 year old when he passes away. And he's contemporary of Gandhi. So he's 1969, oh, sorry, 1869, Gandhi was born. And Srimad Rachandra was born in 1867. So he's a little over a year and a half or two years older than uh, Gandhi. So they're contemporary, um, but Srimad Rachandra does not live too long. He was born in a Jain Hindu family. His father was a Hindu, his mother was a Jain. And um, so he grew up with this, this very um, spiritually fertile um, home. And in, when he was seven years old, um, he had somebody died in the family, uh, uncle, dad's uncle or someone. And he went and he said, oh, what happened to this person? And he says, he died. He said, oh, what is death? And he says, oh, no, no, you do your eat your dinner and go do your homework. You know, he says, you know, like a kid, shoo him away. You don't understand. He goes, no, dad, father, what does mean? What does death mean? He said the death is that when we leave our body and the soul tra transmigrates into different body eventually. And he thought about that as a age seven and um, he was lost in thought. Just like I think Cliff and Rene know Ramana Maharshi, he had this experience of death. And, but he's not his own, but it was somebody else's. And he's in silence and he's thinking about it. And the story goes, or he tells himself, then within days or months, he begins to think, find, remember his old lives, past lives. And he begins, but then he goes for years when he remembers his 800 past lives. And he's so, his memory is so keen and sharp and intelligent that he could do, first he used to do eight tasks at the same time. So eight tasks are, you play with me cards, you play with me um, word game, you play with me, um, just say write poetry on this word, eight things, and I can start that and come to you, chess game, and without any interruption, remember everything. He could do 100 things at the same time. British government gave him awards. 100 things you line up and he will remember where he, it was first move was on the chess or card game or word words wordle or something like that and he will know he had this kind of siddhi but the story makes it interesting thing that according to the biographies that i read they say jainism uh, jainism really believes in renunciation and Srimad Rachand just got in this householder's life. But I, I, as a scholar, I think that, or what I see his life, he's a diamond um, merchant and he sells precious gems. He's a householder. And also he does a, a cloth business at the same time. I mean, imagine that kind of memory and how much business he could do very well. I would love to have that memory. I could read this book and that book and all of them. So mm -hmm. uh, the then the he gets married and has four children. He does not leave them. He doesn't leave his mother. He does not leave his... But the way he does 
his action, and then we'll read the passages that we uh, Rene shared with everybody, what Gandhi says then. He does his work, and as soon as the, the any dealer or the customer leaves, he begins to read the Bhagavad Gita or the Jain text or something, immediately without talking about anything. He just switches. He never, I don't think he ever leaves the mind from action as a service or action as a just doing it. And he does business with such an integrity that he makes really good money. So the sometimes the I was asking again this question to a monastic at this conference, and I said, he had this choice to leave this world. Just like the Mahavira did, just like the Buddha did, just like other people but he did not leave the world. He got married, he had four kids, he had houses, he was a business person. But the way he is acting is such a detached way, such a accepting way, such a just doing action without the psychologically getting involved with that. So I see it as a karma yoga. But Bhagavad Gita's Karma Yoga is act without desiring the fruits of action. Act as service. Act without desire. Act simply because you're supposed to act without any psychological wants. And they all come to us. Like I tell my students, when if you're thinking about all the time your grade, oh, am I going to get B, I'm going to C, go to A, you will miss the point you need to first study, the grades will come. You don't think about grades all the time. You know, students are nowadays, where am I, am I B? Oh my God, I'm a, you know, just no, 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 it's okay. You will be fine. So I think th how I see it, it is a, according to Gandhi, and we'll read that passage, that it is the, I call it karma yoga par excellence, that in this world that I don't see too many historical examples in, um, you know, Gandhi is one of them, but he's not like Srimad Rajchandra was. Um, Gandhi learns from him, and he is like we talk about mythical uh, or the old kings, Janaka did this, and but we see, I see him as a person who lives a life of karma yoga. And I think that will be my thesis, even though it will be interesting what I hear from the other people. But I did talk to them. He said, yeah, that's a many-sided view of the reality. Your view is this one, so that's okay. Uh, but it was very, you know, because I'm going to make this point that they said, oh, because of karma, I didn't leave. I said, no, karma is choice. And he could have left if he wanted to, but he didn't leave. So the whole I minute mean, he lives, he he doesn't also does not do Jain fasting. The Jain fasting is toward the end. Some Jains quit eating when they become very ill, terminally ill, and fast themselves to uh, it's called Salekna to death. He got very sick two years before, you know, in in a nineteen uh, when he was thirty year old, quite colitis, some very very ill. I mean, he did have the choice also to take Salekna. He doesn't do that. And I think he shows an example of how do you live through life, through suffering, through pain, through challenges. And his last words were before he died, he sat in the meditation for six hours. His body was 56 pounds, I think. It's just so weak. He was a skeleton. And he says to his brother, take care of the mother. So that shows you that he is completely dedicated to this world. And he becomes a hero for Gandhi, and Gandhi um, really learns for him that dharma is not simply that either that world or this world, pravarti or nivratti, is the dharma is right now. Dharma is how we live today in this world while being here. How do we keep our minds pure and in intentional and with attention that we are able to do both spirituality and this world at the same time? So I think we should read that couple of passages and then we'll have a circle of you. So, so what he says, Gandhi, it is generally believed that the spheres of practical affairs or business and spiritual pursuit of dharma, sacred duty, are distinct form and incompatible with each other. 
that is madness to introduce dharma into business or we should succeed for we should succeed in neither if we made any such attempt in this belief if this belief is not false there is no hope for us at all there is not a single concern or sphere of practical affairs from where dharma can be kept out shrimad rachandra showed though his life through his life that if a man is devoted to dharma this devotion should be evident in every action of his the business in which he was engaged was that of diamonds with and pearls he was he also ran a cloth shop side by side i formed the impressions that he was completely upright in his dealings i was accidentally present sometimes when he negotiated a deal his terms were always clear and firm i never saw any cleverness about them if the other party tried uh, it he immediately saw through it and would would not tolerate it on such occasions he would even knit his eye, uh, brows in anger and one could see a flash of redness in his eyes so he is feeling angry so how dare you do cheating or how are you just making up all this thing so that's for you um is 26 minutes so i think we should open for conversation thank you thank you so much dina um in the reading that you gave you used the word dharma and um one way i think of dharma as our sacred duty um in, in life and i wondered if we could say that a follow or a, or a practitioner of karma yoga uh, a karma yogi is someone who always does their dharma um so yes but also it has to be connected with the spiritual goal so there is a difference between i do my action with just do my action but here the way i wrote up my little blurb is the the goal is always also the spirituality the liberation so it's always is a path to divine it's not simply living this world um and be you know good business person which is great uh but the karma yoga is the, the yoga is the path to union and the jains have this term called samatva which means equanimity it's very difficult to have equanimity in life we know that how difficult it is to live having evenness even he was at times got angry when somebody messed with him or got you know arked him so is the and that's not a failure and that's the human emotions that come we are in the human body i mean we can't be robots but the whole idea is that we are doing this wor worldly deeds and works but with the eye on the the higher self or the higher purpose and then you know either we see the divine in all in all affairs not simply detachment there has to be something more positive in this the way krishna says in the bhagavad gita that remember me and fight mam anusmara yuddhacha remember me and fight how do we remember you and go to fight meaning that you, i think about every single morning is remember me and fight you know whole whole life is fight you know you go we go in the department and go all kind of challenges of life fight doesn't mean the you know wars i mean that is of course but the what is that we keep that in the challenging situations we keep our dharma of the both that the seeing the divine in everything what we do Yes, Kirk. Thank you, Venus, uh, so much for your um, 13 minute version of uh, a, an enormous tradition and um, and introducing this um, amazing character um, who I've never heard of. And and I'm just uh, thrilled to to be learning something about him. Um, but I, I just wonder if you could clarify 
um, because in your introduction to Jainism, you you mentioned uh, the goal being one of liberation, uh, which um, I was wondering if you can clarify exactly what that means. You know, does that mean simply escaping from the cycle of birth and death? But then now, as you've explained it more, you're talking about seeing the divine in everything. And karma yoga also seems to be action for the benefit of others. So can you can you clarify that for us? What is the goal of Jainism? Million dollar question. That's great. And I am confused sometimes because Jainism does not have a personal God or creator. Jainism doesn't believe in a God. But the jinas are like gods. They are like divine. They're worshipped, right? When you go to a Jain temple, I went to the Jain temple, uh, beautiful statues and all kinds of pujas. They are very Hindu-like pujas. So when I say the divine, and he used the term um, the self, the highest self, that you see the highest self or Atman or Jiva in everyone. So when you see this, the so Jainism, other thing believes in that each so each thing has soul. Each, you know, either there's a matter or there's soul. So when I'm dealing with you, let's say, and we are doing, and I am seeing you as a pure consciousness, how would I deal with you? With a complete, that kind of equal equanimity and love and care, rather than seeing you as the other, which is our Western traditions really uh, focus on even Lavana says the face of the other. You see the other, and here is a different model. You face is other, but their self is the same. You're myself. The jiva is the same. The living, living thing, the living reality that animates you and me is the same. That source, that's divine self. So the goal is in Jainism, unequivocally, is liberation from the cycle of death and rebirth. Unlike the Mahayana Buddhism, which goes, you know, come Bodhisattva again and again and um, liberate others. No, Jainism says, get out. This is a messy world. It's a, it's a lot of thorns and, you know, pokey things. And you can think you're having fun and oh, no. Uh, that's why I think he's so unique to me. Um, and uh, Srimad Rachandra that he is, um, he has made a really a extremely high status in Jainism. And he is, um, his whole um, establishment in Dharampur in uh, Gujarat, thousands of people follow. And some think that he um, was with Shri Mahavira in 25th century BCE, or 2500 BCE. So he was the closest disciple of Mahavira. So he comes to now to liberate. So that kind of high status he has. So that is that. So seeing the every jiva as a um, luminous reality. Mm -hmm. And that's divine. It's a divine jiva. They never so, die. So then you'd be redefining liberation. It would be liberation from the illusion of separateness. Maybe. The liberation from the karmic layers on us and it's like cleaning it out it's like a glass a mirror and just I mean you can call it illusory thing so I think I just find the very semantic ideas we can use different words but it's really for them it's karma it's just really really sticky stuff and you have to wash it off through austerities through good deeds and through doing nothing, because if I do nothing, then I don't make karmas and just completely wash out and then the mirror will shine. Then there's no coming and going. I'll just, I'm shining mirror. I'm Jiva, clean Jiva. Thank you. Uh, whoever, uh, Rene, can you feel the questions, please? <laughs> I don't know who, I don't want to uh, not be in the order. <clears throat> Well, it's it's going to be uh, Carolyn and then Maurice and then Bob. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, what did he have a definite view on the role of women? Um, was he conservative? 
but generous, but, but basically they should um, stay home, become householders, mothers. Um, and yes, they could uh, practice what you're saying that Jane's, um, you know, the method you just described, but um, was it somewhat traditional? We just um, uh, witnessed a few months ago a recently released um, movie on Kasturba Gandhi and discovered, which reveals that she pushed ahead and became a co-worker actually in the uh, the politics, the outside action. Uh, she didn't just um, uh, stay as she started uh, as very much a householder and a mother. So did he have um, gender distinctions in uh, this, the practices that, or the perceptions he had? Excellent question. And that's my one of my research topics. So stay tuned. I'm, that's what I went for to go get research. So they handed, yeah, last night, uh, a book arrived in my doorsteps and no name who sent it. So I can't thank anybody. And it says, just address, not my name. And this big thick book of all of his collected works in Hindi, not in English, they have not been translated. I'm looking for a book, which is called The Liberation and Knowledge, uh, Moral uh, Teachings for Women. A short book that he wrote when he was 25 or 26. He was died at 20, 32, right? He's very young. He didn't have a time to develop, but he wrote a lot. So the Jainism to be, um, Carolyn, does Jainism always had monastic order for women. Unlike Buddhism, where women, the Ananda had to fight for women's you know, monastic um, structures. Jain Mahavira gave women from the very beginning, um, lay men, lay women, lay uh, or the monks and nuns. Always women had the right to uh, practice um, and take the vows of monastic vows. So that's the one thing. And But there is always a patriarchy and gender issues in every tradition. And I have written an article recently, but the Jain women, even I saw at this conference, they were always on the stage. They were introducing the guru. They were, they are forging um, ahead. And so he didn't say anything about his wife. Um, his, um, I have no idea, he has two daughters, but he, we don't hear. I, uh, the later on stories I heard that he, she also renounced in the end along with his mother and became, and I don't know what happened then. So I still have to find out if there is written down anything about it. But he was for the, he said women should be educated, women should not be treated like second class citizens. That's what I have heard a little bit. And that's my uh, research topic is um, for the next year of looking at how what he's saying and how it might have affected Jane women's lives uh, eventually in the tradition. So that's, that's a great question. Thank you. Okay, Morris. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Vina. As very illuminating to get down to the basic points of Jainism. Uh, and you also conveyed some of the flavor, including some of the practices which seem extreme to some of us, actually, and what their meanings are. And uh, uh, my, my question is, uh, uh, maybe it's a Buddhist concept of dependent origination, but what it really is, is, um, so he was in the diamond trade. And we have heard, although I don't have evidence, that there is probably a lot of exploitation. In fact, even Gandhi, uh, I think, was criticized uh, when he was in South Africa for some of this, too. And so uh, I'm wondering, then, how you kind of reconcile, uh, if you want to call it, the bad aspects of capitalism uh, and the exploitation that goes on uh, with this notion of being nonviolent uh, and being so pure. Uh, yes. That's, a, uh, that's my question always. Um, so like I said, living means killing. No matter what you will do, there's exploitation. 
And the Jains were not supposed to do farming because it kills microorganisms. I don't think back then they had that conversation about how the mining is causing violence as well, like we have now knowledge, but nevertheless, they knew. So what happened? A lot of Jains are super affluent because they took the traits of, you know, even now, if you go to India, Jain jewelers are the most famous. Even today, you go to Jaipur, it's a pink city where the emeralds and uh, the rubies and uh, diamonds, and they, they are the most, so I call it paradox, you know, how do you live the both, right? How do you do? So that's why I think no matter what you do, they thought that it was the least violent business because you're dealing with rocks, not living beings, not, you know, pulling carrots out, not, you know, chopping, you know. So they were very careful about that, but they didn't realize that itself that also causes violence, right? So now everybody knows that, that all trades that people do let it be construction, let it be, you know, all kinds of traits are violent, let whatever we do in this world. That's the whole point is that Jains like to renounce the world. That's why living means killing. So you do less and less in this world. And they know that they are very humble about it. They say, you know what? I am in this thick of this mud. I have talked to many Jain uh, lay followers as well. I'm going to do good karmas by helping the monastic community charity, good deeds, making this world a better place. They're more going into karma yoga path, more because the Hindu Jainism was not like opposed. Same thing with, you know, they were overlapping systems and I call it uh, concurrent streams and yet intersecting on many places. So there are a lot of culturally they're thinking about, you know, I do good deeds, charity is very big deal, uh, uh, giving to others, giving to poor, feeding others so uh, now they do you know millions of meals all over the world so you mitigate your bad karma with good karma but the, in the end you have to renounce that's yeah. the only way out there is no other way in hinduism there's a way out through karma yoga in jainism you have to renounce that's why even some householders they will if they are terminally ill let's say they have cancer and they say you know you have one year to live or six months, whatever it might be, they choose to um, slowly wean themselves out of any foods and eventually drinks, and they will have a whole monastic community support, and they call it salekna, and they they die very aware of. Um, so they say that through that they burn off a lot of karmas and have the soul. So they are very aware of that. It's not, you know, I know students ask that too. You know, well, this is rich and this capitalist. So yes. They are part of it, but they are very aware of that. They're not denying it, that they're not committing violence. Thank, Thank you. you. Your turn. Bob. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, I wanted to comment a little bit about Kirk's point about liberation and a lot of what you're saying as well. Um, one of the things I love about Jainism is what's called, they call it the three gems. Uh, and they all fit together in terms of practice in this world. Not so much, you know, total renunciation to the end, but in this world, you have to have uh, three things. And they're not three steps, but three interconnected parts of the gem, facets. And the first is right faith, um, samyak darshana that you, you have sort of the intention of doing the right thing. And I think equanimity is built around that of, let's just do the best we can. And the attitude is still pointed towards the spiritual of not harming. And then the second part of the gem is right knowledge, uh, samyak yana, yana yoga kind of thing. And there, you know, you're really focusing on getting your head in the right place when it comes to harming and harming not only others but harming yourself and so that kind of relates and then finally the last aspect of the the three gems is right conduct samyak charitra and that that comes to the karma yoga of doing things in the world and so you know combining all of that i think is a, is a way of practicing towards liberation without the idea that 
you're going to make it in this lifetime. But this lifetime, you know, you've got to, as you said, you know, mitigate the karma. You've got to, you know, at least don't create new karma. And this this gem aspect is is along that kind of line. And even if you deal with the good and bad karma in this life, you still have to deal with your past lives. So there's other sides of of that. Um, so that, that I've always loved that combination of things. It's a little different than Buddhism and and Hinduism uh, in how to put it together. The question I had is oftentimes, you know, I will see a statue of the Buddha or I'll see a statue of the Hindu gods. But in Jainism, I oftentimes see, uh, you know, a block with a carved out absence. In other words, the absence of a person. I don't know if you, I, I'm if I'm describing it right, but you know where there's actually you're looking not so much at the statue of something, but you're looking at the absence of something, and the and the background is it. So I'm wondering if that relates to a sense of emptiness, shunyata, in any way, not depicting a person, because I don't think uh, Mahavira was ever shown. The Buddha was shown in sculptures and things. I am not under Mahavira is shown everywhere. On, oh, um, oh, not sure. So this, uh, this, and the, the. I just visited the temple. This exquisite mm -hmm. statue of uh, Mahavira. This is so all made with white marble from Jaipur, which also causes violence when you pull them out from quarries. So I think it's a whole temple was white uh, uh, marble. But so, you've seen the cutouts of the absence, haven't you? I have not seen cutout of the oh. absence. Okay, maybe I'm just thinking of something rather rare, but I have seen that where it's just almost like a cutout and it's gone. And so you're looking at the absence of a shape. You know, you it's just- Share with me later. You know, I- Yeah, have... okay, I was just curious. I, I think of it as a classic Jane figure, but the, the three gems thing was what I was gonna yeah, try Yeah, the, the three about. gems are very interesting the way you describe, of course, for those lay people, but they always, most of the time, they're putting into the monastic way. They were saying, oh, Srimad Rajchandra had some mekdarshan, meaning view of reality, the way reality is. So we do not see the way the reality is. We see the reality as you and I are seeing each other, human beings, persons, all the baggage that I have for each whole world. This is seeing Atman, Jiva in you, nothing but that pure Jiva in you. So they, when I read Srimad Rajchandra, I was reading last night in Hindi a little bit, and they said, uh, Srimad Rajchandra attained Samyak Darshan. Because the, yes, we, we should attempt to have a reality. That's what the Karma Yoga comes in, that I see in each one of uh, us, that luminous essence that it's, this we all hold. But we don't see that. You know, when we are angry or not, we're doing business, it's yours, it's me, and, you know, all kind of dualities. But according to the text that Srimad Rajchandra had this, all those three, Samak Gyan, Samak Darshan, Samak Charitra, he had achieved them, realized them. We attempt, and he had realized them. So that's the, the hallmark of a enlightened being or the jiva, uh, 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 jina, who is awakened one. Awakened one has no dreams anymore, no illusions anymore. They see the way things are. This is their second nature to be, some make the right conduct. They don't have to try it. And the same thing, they have to be samyak or the pure knowledge um, in all three. But for the householder or the people who are striving for then we all try. So that's a good point. Thank you. Okay, David and then Cliff. Thank you, Veena. Awesome to see you. Thank you. Same here. Your GY is beautiful and your person too. <laughs> I'm, I was struck a lot by the uh, notion of karma and the various um, uh, pursuits uh, in terms of occupations. And I'm thinking that your occupation is one of those that seems to be very low in karmic loading. Would, would you say? Teaching? Well, Gandhi would say that the education, educational systems can be very violent. 
because if I always exploit, I have seen students frightened by their professors. I have seen them frightened by their grades. I have seen people committing suicide. They didn't get what they wanted to. Hmm. So any, any task, yes, you're right, but I am very mindful of that when I walk in the classroom, thanks to these teachings that I have been studying and I, I fall and fa fail, but I'm very mindful of that, that making a classroom, very nonviolent classroom. And I think it's the, um, it's the, what happens once I am in the classroom on the, on the, you know, front of the classroom, I, I automatically asserted authority with, on students. And that authority can be scary for young people, you know, and they see, oh my God, she's going to fail us. Oh my God, she's so smart, or they are so this, and this, they have so many degrees and they are, you know, I don't even know. We, even though it's not true, but still the, the perception of the fear. I mean, the grades were the system I grew up in India, educational was the most violent system you can imagine. If I had 104 fever and I miss the exam, I will fail the entire year. And I have to repeat it. They will not give you a second chance. Worse than karma theory. Karma gives you second chances. So I think it's that you're right. That any, what I say, I think that karma yoga is the, the beauty of karma yoga is this. Any action, including action of a butcher, action of a meat seller, that's the, you know, Mahabharata talks about that. Any harsh actions can be positive if we have our right attitude, right darshan. If we see simply as an action and we can make anything violent if we are, of course, Jainism recognizes that we have to avoid violent uh, trades. They said we shouldn't work in the war, in the military. We should not work for uh, as a butchers. We should not be meat cutters. We should not be you know, hunters, you know, we shouldn't. So Buddha too, they, they tell you what certain kinds of traits have more propensity for killing and harming, of course. But we can make things violent, even if they were not by nature violent traits. That's my point. That makes sense, David? Yes, very much. The, the other thing that struck me was the term you put into the chat, uh, Anakanta Vata. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just finishing up my studies in, in marriage and family. And <clears throat> somewhere around, I think, the 60s, 70s, there was a, a transition in theories, what we call from a classical or modern to postmodernism, yes. where suddenly now we're looking at this idea that there are many sided views of reality. Uh, and it seems like um, maybe a transition. I don't know if it's just sort of rehappening in our culture. But it does seem like th something that is emerging as an awareness um, within the human population. That's an excellent point. There's somebody called it Gan was Gandhi, a postmodernist. Uh, but, but the idea here is that even if we are postmodern, we are so dogmatic about views. And the whole point is that we become so dogmatic about views. It's like uh, James give this example of, or this parable is you know, very old, Buddhist, Hindu. The, uh, five blind men and elephant, and they each one of is touching the elephant, and they're saying elephant is a wall, elephant is a fan, elephant is a you know trunk, but neither one of them is right. So I think even though we we understand it's a postmodern view of reality, but we still have a lot of dogmatism in our views. Otherwise, we'll be able to dialogue with one another. Dogmatism does not allow dialogue, and I see the dialogue is breaking even in our postmodern days. Do you agree? Yeah, with, with rare exceptions. That's right. That's right. So, like you. right here and now. Yeah, I mean, that's why we have the circle here. Yeah. Thank you, Vina. Cliff, can I call on you? Yeah, it'd be great. Good to see you, Vina. Good to see you, Cliff. Um, it's, 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 I'm intrigued, uh, David. I was thinking very much about that term, too, Ani Kattavada, and how. If if that was that notion was in all the religions as it is in Jainism that we could see all the different religions and and traditions as different uh, ways to truth that would be I think a lot of violence would be removed from the world 
I was wondering about this idea of Anikatabhata and, and karma yoga in that normally you think uh, what karma yoga get, um, is getting changing the field of action from a, a, a Kuru Shetra into a... Um, into a Dharma shape, yes. uh, you know, field of karma, yes. the field of Dharma. And the root term for of Dharma is to hold. And I always thought that being, you know, Dharma had to do with holding on to truth. And uh, Gandhi often would put uh, the vow of truth first, um, Satya first, and then and then from Satya you would be able to get to ahimsa. But when you hold, if you hold on to just your point of view of truth, um, that can be kind of dogmatic, right? Right. So how do we take this idea of anikatavada into the idea of, of fulfilling one's dharma? How do we bring those together? You know, all these different points of view and still be able to engage in action when we kind of see things our own way. Yes. So the answer lies in Jainism itself. So even though Jains say um, many-sidedness of truth, but they cling to their own side of truth. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you don't do violence to other sides of truth. So you cannot not have an anchor. You, then there'll be a lot of postmodernism, which is this is right, this is right, this is right, this is right, this is okay, this is okay. But then the capital T truth will get lost. So there is something about that reality, which is escapes mm -hmm. our mind and senses. And, you know, we are constantly are striving towards Gandhi said, I'm not able to catch, get hold of truth, right? And neither dharma, we can't. You know, end of the war, Krishna gives Arjuna to remember me and fight, and everybody cries after the war. Nobody is happy. Everybody feels dharma has been violated. But that dharma, it doesn't mean that it's perfect, perfection. That's the whole point is. That's why the whole giving up is the point. And that's the point come when Gandhi too, he said, I want to be zero toward the end of his autobiography, he says, I'm trying to be zero. So again, Kirk and um, Maurice, the shunya is zero and full at the same time. When you add value to it, it becomes millions. Shunya, zero, 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 and become one million, 10 million, billion. But without take away the one or two, then becomes empty. Zero has no value. But its value lies with our relationship, our conceptions, where we put that number in front of zeros. But the idea is to, to understand that, that zero is also still a moving central circle that is connected with everyone and everything. And if there is somebody is giving that, you know, small t truth, if somebody says about some religion to me, you know, in my religion, I think it's okay to kill this or this. I mean, I know it's not true from my own faith. I'm not going to say you're right. I will say, well, you know, but the, you know, teachers would not have said that. And maybe, so it doesn't mean that we suspend our uh, intelligence or rational ability. So that will be kind of very dogmatic too. So we need to be, open-eyed and open mind and the whole idea of anekantavada also is compassion rather than being judging that person saying you know what you're just so stupid you know how can you just say you just don't have any brains to follow this religion you know i've seen people saying those words and you go you know that's violent to way say that you know you can guide them to different way but it's um you know, the whole thing is compassion and understanding that each one is seeing the blind elephant, you know, elephant room, you know, their blind eyes. But I think that uh, on the positive side of what you just said, if you're saying show compassion, what does that mean in action? And maybe what it means is drawing the best out of people. Right. And taking their limited truths and 
drawing a larger circle or synthesizing. And when Gandhi, from what I've read, would go into a village, he wouldn't start with nonviolence and this, that. He would actually listen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and as he had a meeting with people, he would pick out the best that people said, and he would kind of try to conjoin it with something that pointed to something larger. True, true, absolutely, you're right. So compassion doesn't come in one side, right? You know, the deep listening is, the whole two days teaching of this teacher uh, at the Jane conference was on deep listening. Uh -huh. I took so many notes. He said, you know what we do? We do not listen carefully to people. He said, 70% is the um, nonverbal communication. That's why it's so hard with the email and phones and, you know, the personal is very important because we, he's, he really was point after point, was very intellectual talk. I was surprised to see, as a matter of fact, not about God, not about liberation, not about anything except how to listen. Mm -hmm. And that was so cool to have in relationships and friendships in the world, in the business, in students, how we can really, and that's compassion. If I have your ears when you're talking to me, that is compassion. And that's why I think we're not doing it. And when Gandhi said, atheists um, are, they are following truth. Why should I misjudge them? Why do I call them any less? Then he called truth his God rather than God is truth. Rather than saying, oh, you don't have God. You must be, you know, who knows what? You know, he said, no, no. Each one of us following the truth in different ways. And that's the, I think, the understanding you uh, bring to this idea. Well, I'm looking at our time and I'm very sad to see that we're at the top of our hour. I hope that we um, did as you wished, uh, Vina, in terms of listening and then also adding into the conversation. Beautiful, um, thank you. I'm going to ask um, that's one of you um, consider giving the vote of thanks for Vina after I um, finish telling a little bit about what we'll be doing for the next couple of weeks. This uh, talk on karma yoga to me seems to have really established a wonderful um, platform for um, conversing on the next two topics. Um, both of these come from the Indian epic, the Ramayana. And the first is um, in honor of um, Prince Rama's birth. Um, so it the topic is Prince Rama, unwavering, someone who is truly a, a karma yogi, I suspect. And then the next week on April 20th, we will be um, considering the topic of Sri Hanuman for Hanuman Jayanti. And um, that's Sri Hanuman devoted. So maybe getting a little bit of an idea of how a being who was both um, very active and very devoted uh, operated in the world. Uh, and then the following week on um, April 27th, we have um, John Powers, um, who's with us today also, speaking on the topic from the unreal to the real. So it's a really a, a wonderful lineup. Uh, by the way, the person who is going to speak on uh, Prince Rama unwavering is the person who took on the role of Prince Rama uh, in our enactment of the Ramayana, this last Diwali. And the person who's going to speak on Sri Hanuman is um, someone who is quite a Hanuman devotee himself, Ram Das Lam, the UH um, professor of religious studies. So we really do have a wonderful lineup ahead of us. Um, it, it just couldn't be any better than we already had today though. Is there someone who would like to give a vote of thanks to, to Vina? Is that Michael? Would you like to say a word or two? A namaste is also wonderful. I would love to say a word or two. Okay, thank yeah. you, David. Uh, Vina, thank you. I always appreciate the professionalism that you bring to these talks um, and your use of inquiry. 
And uh, as you said there near the end, um, it's evident how you bring deep listening uh, to to this group. Um, and, uh, it, and it really uh, feels like compassion uh, when you when you listen to our questions and answer them with such clarity uh, and such thought. So I really, really appreciate having you in this circle. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Lovely to see you always, my friends and family. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Brilliant and instructive, you know. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for being together. <laughs> appreciate it. Great to have all of you here. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Aloha.